Even in this day and age of airplanes, space shuttles, and drones, hot air balloons still capture the imagination. Majestic, large, and often colorful, there's something truly incredible about watching a hot air balloon in flight. And it was with hot air balloons that man first ventured into the heavens. Despite this, while most can name the inventors of the first airplane to achieve sustained flight, few have any idea who invented the first hot air balloon which was capable of carrying a human. So, will allow us to rectify this. In the pre-modern world, there were plenty of examples that can be considered a precursor to hot air balloons. For example, sometime starting around the 4th century BC, the Chinese first started using fire balloons, or what we know of today as Chinese lanterns, as signals during warfare, to send letters, and to commemorate festivals. Using virtually the same concept as hot air balloons, the lanterns are lifted by a candle that heats air. As for a more scientific approach to things in more modern times, in the early 17th century, Galileo proved that air had weight. After that came a series of experiments and ideas around creating something that was lighter than air. Considered the father of aeronautics, Jesuit Italian priest Francesco Lanatiesi drew up plans for what is basically a flying boat. According to Lanatiesi's written and drawn explanations, the system used round spheres with the air vacuumed out, therefore making them lighter than air, and thus making the vessel float. While impractical given the technology of the age, he was on the right track. Several decades later, in 1709, in front of King John V, Portuguese priest Bartolomeu de Gasmeo showed off a small paper balloon that levitated to the palace ceiling. But this was a far cry from being able to transport a human. This brings us to the late 18th century, when the Montgolfier brothers took up the task of perfecting hot air balloons. Born into a family of paper manufacturers in Annonay in France, Joseph and Etienne were set for a comfortable life producing scrolls until, as legend has it, Joseph keenly observed a phenomenon while watching laundry dry over a fire. With smoke rising from the fire, billows of air formed in the clothes' fabric, pushing the garments up and creating bubbles of air. Not quite understanding what was happening, he believed that the smoke had a special gas in it, which he named after himself Montgolfier gas. Whether that's how inspiration struck or not, thinking that such a flying instrument concept could be used for military advantage, he got his brother on board to investigate further what Joseph would later call a cloud in a paper bag. June 4, 1783 was the first demonstration of a Montgolfier balloon in the marketplace of their hometown of Annonay. Made from taffeta, fabric, and paper materials, and weighing around 500 pounds, the balloon actually floated to an estimated altitude of 6,000 feet, that's 1.8 kilometers. Knowing that they were onto something, they made their way to Paris to showcase their invention. And so it was that in September of 1783, King Louis XVI and his wife Marie Antoinette, along with 130,000 curious French citizens, stood in the Palace of Versailles courtyard to witness a demonstration of this modern marvel. Thirty feet in diameter, the colorful balloon was made from taffeta, a type of silk, and coated with a fireproofing alum varnish. It was decorated with golden flourishes, bright yellow suns for King Louis, who was known as the Sun King, and zodiac signs. A wicker basket was suspended from the bottom of the balloon in which resided the first living passengers to experience a hot air balloon ride. While Louis XVI had apparently suggested using prisoners for this test flight, what the brothers actually decided to use was a duck, a rooster, and a sheep. With a rousing cheer, the balloon was filled with hot air, untethered, and it lifted off. After the balloon landed safely in the woods after an eight-minute and two-mile flight, the animals were described as not having suffered a bit, reportedly, to say the least, much astonished. Though I guess in contrary to what is reported, this would have been a bit of an exaggeration with regards to the duck. And with that though, the first hot air balloon flight with passengers was a success. A month after animals, physics and chemistry teacher Jean-Francois Piliatre de Rosier was the first human to take a trip in a tethered hot air balloon. On November 21, 1783, Rosier was joined by a French military officer named Marquis de Hollande in a Montgolfier hot air balloon. After several practice runs to get a feel of how to work the balloon, they finally made their first untethered flight with human passengers, leaving at 2 p.m. from the Chateau de la Mouette to the Butte-Ouquet. 
This 25-minute flight covered about five and a half miles, that's nine kilometers, with the balloon reaching an altitude of nearly 3,000 feet, that's 0.9 kilometers. At the completion of the flight, there was enough fuel left to have allowed the balloon to go nearly four to five times as far, but parts of the balloon itself started to catch on fire, so they chose to land early. Upon landing, the pilots drank champagne to celebrate, which started the tradition still sometimes maintained by balloonists to this very day. None other than great American Ben Franklin, who was serving as the the United States' ambassador to France was in attendance for this historic moment when man first slipped the surly bonds of Earth. Franklin later wrote in his journal about what he witnessed that day. We observed it lift off in the most majestic manner. When it reached around 250 feet in altitude, the intrepid voyagers lowered their hats to salute the spectators. We could not help feeling a certain mixture of awe and admiration. However, with flight, Came danger. On June the 15th, 1785, Rosier accomplished another first. The first to die in a balloon accident when his balloon, filled with hydrogen and hot air, exploded while he attempted to fly across the English Channel. And so it was that another Frenchman, Jean Pierre Francois Blanchard, and his American financier for the trip, John Jeffries, became the first to cross the English Channel in a balloon, though not without difficulty. In fact, as the trip progressed, it became very apparent that they were too heavy, and unfortunately for the duo, neither could swim. Thus, they ditched their ballast bags first, then, when still skimming just above the water, ditched a bag of mail that they were supposed to deliver. Next, they chucked a bottle of brandy overboard. Next went a barometer, a thermometer, and a telescope. Not rising much, Blanchard stripped completely naked while Jeffries decided to keep his undergarments. They also ditched their anchor and, eventually, the steering equipment. Yet, through all of this, still they found themselves dangerously close to the water. That's when Jeffries later stated, We were able to obtain, I verily believe, between five and six pounds of urine, which circumstance, however trivial or ludicrous it may seem, I have reason to believe was of real utility to us. Even with all of this, the bottom of the basket still touched the water just as they were coming in to the sight of shore. It was at this point that the two men grabbed their cork life jackets, preparing to sink. As luck would have it, however, a large gust of wind came up and pushed the balloon up into the air and towards the shore. Ultimately, the craft settled over the Felmore's forest, where the balloon caught some branches and the pair ultimately landed safely. They soon found some locals willing to lend them some clothes and give them a ride into town. Becoming something of a celebrity, Blanchard took his balloon show on the road and became the first to fly in a balloon in several countries. For example, in 1794, Blanchard took off from Philadelphia in front of George Washington, who had expressed his fascination with ballooning in numerous letters. Because Blanchard was not an American citizen, Washington gave him a written passport, guaranteeing him rightful and safe passage no matter where he landed in the country. 45 minutes later, Blanchard landed in Gloucester County. County, New Jersey. By the mid-19th century, ballooning had been established as little more than an exciting novelty. It was Thaddeus Lowe who first successfully showed that it could be used for military purposes. A self-taught meteorologist, Lowe was using balloons to help his studies of the weather, but when the Civil War broke out in April of 1861, Lowe knew that he could be of help to the Union. On April the 19th, 1861, he took off in his balloon from his home state of Kentucky in the hopes of landing on the White House lawn so that he could impress President Lincoln. Instead, he landed in South Carolina, Confederate territory. After taking a train, he ended up meeting Lincoln in June of 1861 and convinced him that balloons would make the perfect surveillance equipment. On September 24, 1861, he ascended more than a thousand feet into the air in Arlington and spotted Confederate troops over three miles away. Relaying that information to the Union, the Confederates were attacked a short time later. Lowe and his balloon would prove to be invaluable to the Union, creating a tactical advantage for the remaining days of the war. Because of his constant presence behind enemy lines, Lowe is known as the Civil War's most shot-at man. As the years went on, balloons continued to improve and capture the imagination. The late 20th century still had a few firsts for hot air balloons, including the first Atlantic crossing in 1987 and the first Pacific crossing in 1991. Finally, in 2002, Steve Fawcett completed the first non-stop around-the-world hot air balloon flight. And we've no doubt that the duck, the rooster, and the sheep would certainly have been impressed. And now for a bonus fact. The first ever helium-inflated airship, the USS Shenandoah, was destroyed after getting caught up in an extreme updraft, resulting in it ascending rapidly from 2,100 feet to 6,200 feet, that's 640 meters, to 1,889 meters, and then subsequently being able to descend, but then getting caught up in an even more severe updraft, bursting some of its helium bags and breaking the keel. The ship was torn apart and crashed into the ground. 
Amazingly, 29 of the 43 crew members managed to survive the crash by taking refuge in three different places of the ship that still had at least some loft as they descended rather than a freefall. Unluckily for them, though, most who survived this crash later died on the Akron airship, which broke up and sunk in the Atlantic, killing 73 of the crew, with only three surviving. The Akron crash at the time was the deadliest in aviation history. It's also noteworthy here that the J-3 blimp sent to search for the survivors of the Akron crash also crashed into the ocean, though in this case, only two people died. It's also noteworthy that the USS Shenandoah would not have been destroyed at all had Commander Lansdowne's superiors listened to him. The flight it was destroyed in was made under protest as Commander Lansdowne knew that late summer weather in Ohio often had weather conditions unsuitable for flying an airship through. However, because of the expense of the airship, military brass felt that they couldn't afford delays or cancellation of the flight as the airship had been extremely expensive and they needed to show it off in order to help sway taxpayers to view the ship more favorably. Obviously, that did not work out. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below and don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this every day of the week. For more from me, why not check out my other channel called Biographics? You will find that linked to below this video. And as always, thank you for watching.